Hi guys, it has turned into a rainy day here in the end times in paradise in Garfield, Texas. But we're going to head up to Northampton, Massachusetts today, or Northampton, Massachusetts today, where I have the great honor and pleasure of bringing to you a conversation with my Humpty Dumpty tribe hero, Michael T. Clare, who doesn't need much introduction. All I'm going to say at this point, because you know, you guys know who, who uh, Michael is. He is technically a professor of peace and world security at Hampshire College, and he is also the author of a bunch of books, many of which I've featured here, including Resource Wars, Blood and Oil, and The Race for What's Left. And we're going to be spending a little while with uh, Michael Clare. So, Michael Clare, say hello to Humpty Dumpty Tribe. You know, it's just a terrific pleasure to be with all you folks. I, I look forward to this conversation with you, Sam, and all the listeners. Now, 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 it, it, that's fine because most some people know my name is Sam, but uh, I, my, my name is Hambone on this, on this channel, but Sam, Sam will work. Okay, Hambone. Either way, <laughs> happy to be in conversation with you. Okay, so I'm just going to let, let me just figure out where to dive in since I don't have any questions written out. I spent several hours last night uh, sitting on my back porch listening to some former uh, talks you have given on YouTube and interviews you have had. And, and I was particularly enjoyed this hour and a half speech you gave, I believe, University of New England, somewhere up there in Maine. It was during the Rom Mitt Romney uh, Obama campaign, um, you know, back, you know, years ago in the, for the 2012 election. And in that speech, you know, you, we're going now close to six years ago, you were talking about how we needed to get our act together and we needed to get our act together, you, you know, right now uh, to turn this freight train around. Okay, brother, it's six years later. Uh, instead of uh, who, who I call Farrakh Obama or Mitt Romney in the White House, we now have Donald Trump in the White House. We have the president of Russia making little cartoons of nuclear bombs dropping on, Fl on Florida. We have the North Pole melting uh, like an ice cube in July up here in the middle of February. We've had the three warmest years on record. The IEA is all over the news today claiming how the United States is going to achieve energy independence and we're going to be pumping 17 million barrels of oil every day and how global demand for oil is just going to keep going up, up, up. Michael Clare, where are we uh, in February of 2018 and, and where is our timeline as the doomsday clock has moved ever closer to midnight? Give us your opinion of the state of the planet in March 5th, 2018. Very good. Uh, you know, we could spend a long time discussing that, and I'm, I'm sure we will. Uh, the way I look at it is we're, we've entered a new period, and, and, and we, should, we should think about that. I, I, we could call it the new Cold War or something else, and, and we could have fun trying to think up of the proper name for it. But whatever the name is, we're not in the period that we were in uh, starting a, a year ago. That was a different era. We could call that the post-Cold War era or the New World Order era or something uh, when it seemed that the world was at least capable of cooperating to address global problems like climate change and nuclear weapons and human rights and health and other issues. There was a collaborative nature in that world. Well, that world is now gone and, you know, I, I don't see it coming back anytime soon. 
Instead, we're in a new world, and the White House has described this new world. It says that we're in a, a, a world of, of renewed great power competition, meaning competition between the major powers, the U.S., Russia, and China. And this competition is one in which nuclear weapons are in the forefront, and it's one in which issues like climate change and human rights are going to be pushed to the margins, and it's going to be an all-out struggle for global dominance, and uh, war will be constantly on the horizon. Now, I, I don't know about uh, your listeners, uh, Hambone, I, I grew up in the Cold War period, and, and, and this sounds eerily familiar to that time when the threat of nuclear war was ever-present, and we, we figured out how to survive, but it, 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 it was a, a different time, and, and I think that that kind of era is back. So I'll start with that. I'm just going to let you pretty much keep keep on talking, brother. As I say, the the, the less I did, just uh, back out of this, and as I say, I, I could sit here with a list of 500 individual questions of, of things on my mind. But we're here. Uh, uh, people are sick of hearing what's on Hambon Littletail's mind. They want to know what's on, on Michael Claire's mind. C connect some dots. Well, what, well, what is the difference between y y you're, you and I, you might be a couple of years older than me, but we're roughly the same age. I see the, the, the two major differences between when, when you and I were, let's say, 10 years old and for a 10 year old today is there's two or three times as many people on this planet and we've used up a whole hell of a lot of the resources that we had available to, 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 to feed and supply one half as many people uh, back then. And obviously you, are, you have spent your lifetime thinking about this paradox and this contradiction and, and, and what it means. So. Just, just, just run with it a while uh, about how things have gone on this planet and the direction we're heading as we head towards 2050 or 2100. <laughs> 2100, I, yeah. I dare and think about. But as we move towards uh, 2050, well, uh, I, I think what we've seen in, in this period that you describe, Hambone, is you know, a race between uh, human needs, human resource requirements, and the pursuit of resources on one hand, and and the ability of technology to keep up with that, to keep supplying us with our requirements. And, you know, we have to say that technology has done a pretty good job. So, for example, uh, 10 years ago, I was saying that, that by, by now, by, by 2015 even, uh, by 2020, the supply of petroleum was going to be on a rapid decline curve. We call that the peak oil, uh, peak oil theory. Well, it turns out that we were wrong about that prediction because the technology of extraction of petroleum from shale moved at such a swift pace and became affordable at such a, you know, the production costs went down so rapidly. So now there's a glut of oil, and the glut of oil has surprising consequences. I, I was all concerned about the consequences of scarcity. I, I, I predicted wars over a diminishing supply of oil. That's one set of scenarios. I never thought about the consequences of a glut of oil. And then that's what we have now. And the consequences of that can be equal, equally serious. We see that in Venezuela, for example. Here's, here's a country that probably has more oil than anywhere else on the planet. And you would think that this would be a rich, prosperous country, but it's in free fall because the governments there promised to use all that money for social benefits, and they did try, but it assumed that the price of oil would be $100 or $150 a barrel, and it, it went down to $30. Yeah. And 
and, and the government wasn't able to sustain its, its promises, and the infrastructure collapsed, and the medical system collapsed, and it's a state of chaos, anarchy in Venezuela as a consequence. And you see the same thing in Nigeria and other places around the world. So we have a glut of oil. Uh, but the Is that going to last long? Do you, do you for, for, for see the, the glut lasting long, or is this just going to be a brief flash in the pan? Are, are you, are you are, has peak oil just been delayed? Or is, or is it no longer, uh, well, my, my point on this, I used to be solidly into peak oil, but I've kind of moved over to the, uh, I guess it's the Bill McKibben camp for lack of a better word, that the, the race now seems to be between peak oil and taking, and, and the planet as I hyperbolize by say going Venus, that that if we just burn what we already have, you know, that doing the math uh, about where that's going to take the temperature, and I think that we're going to burn the planet up before we ever hit peak oil. So, run, run, what, what's your feeling on, on, on that race to the bottom between the global warming effects of burning okay. the oil and running out of it? Yes, I, I, I see exactly what you're talking about. It. And my sense is that this is going to be a matter of social behavior and economics and government policy. So you're absolutely right that if we keep on consuming oil and coal and natural gas on the path we're currently on, uh, temperatures will rise much higher than any scientists were predicting even a few years ago. And the consequences of that will be much more catastrophic than they were predicting even a few years ago. I mean, we're seeing today uh, the consequences of climate change that scientists a few years ago were saying would come in 2040 and 2050 and 2060. Yeah. Here so imagine if, if we consume oil at the rate we're doing now and the, the tempo of temperature rise continues at the same pace, we're going to see in another five or ten years what the scientists were predicting for 2100, like the melting of the Arctic, uh, of, of the Greenland's ice cap and the Antarctic ice cap, and that means, you know, two, three, five, ten feet of sea level rise plus intense storms, making cities like Miami uninhabitable. Not not at 2100, but in 2025 or yeah. 2030. So you're absolutely right about this. The question is, will societies make the decision to prevent that from happening or not? And some are making strides in the direction of averting that kind of, of a catastrophic outcome. But most are not. And the big ones are, that is, the U.S. and China and Europe as a whole, are, are simply not moving fast enough to prevent those outcomes from occurring. Uh, so at some point, uh, at the worst case analysis, you'll have social collapse uh, well before, well before uh, we consume all of the oil in the ground. So that, that, that is your vision right now. Is, 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 has there been a... No, no, let, me, let me just qualify that. Yeah. As these catastrophic conditions occur, you know, it's going to be like a knock on the head. And people in various parts of the world will say, oh my God, we had better do something fast. And so the transition to renewables will speed up at a much faster rate. So there will be an equilibrium at some point. There, there will be an equilibrium whereby uh, we stop using fossil fuels entirely and rely entirely on renewables. But I, but I, I don't know. I don't know how much damage will it take before people reach that point. Um, and you know, look at Florida. If if, if I were a resident of Florida, 
which is the, the most uh, vulnerable state in the United States, they sh everyone there should be banning cars entirely. <laughs> but you don't see signs of it. But banning, uh, let, let's say that, that we banned cars in Florida and nobody, at the, they built a, 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 a brick wall across the Georgia and Alabama line. There's what, 17 million cars were sold in China last year, I believe. Was it 17, 18 million cars sold in China? Is banning cars in Florida uh, gonna, you know, keep Miami from being uninhabitable when we're selling 18 million year, uh, cars a year in China and, and we'll be selling 18 million in India uh, in another five years? Yeah, so that's why I say this is a matter of social policy, n not, uh, not, n not technology or geology. So China says, China, Chinese leaders say, well, we're going to be the leaders in electric cars, so that, yes, 18 million cars might be sold in China, but uh, in another five years, they'll, they'll, all, all of them will be electric cars. Uh, and they're going to make that happen. If they make that happen, well, that would have profound consequences. And if Indi India says they're going to move in the same direction towards all electric cars. So the, the question is whether they will actually carry through with, these, with this talk, with these policy prescriptions. Uh, if, if they do it, you know, maybe we have some hope. In this country, under the present administration, we don't have that kind of hope. So, where, as long as long as you've brought up electric cars and phasing out fossil fuels, and and you know, I've always made it the plan that that I am generally in support. Uh, I, I'm completely in support of phasing out fossil fuels, and I'm generally in support of electric cars and and renewable energy. Are you of the camp that believes that electric cars and renewable energy is going to, quote, save the planet, or is, is that going to be enough? Is, is, is that response, just tackling fossil fuels, uh, going to be enough to uh, turn the freight train around for what's coming our way at this point? Uh, you know, I, and like I say, I think we're going to experience far more damage from climate change before we're going to make the necessary adjustments. So uh, how, it, it, can we support a population of 9 or 10 billion people in a, on a planet that's much more ravaged than it is today? in my mind, is a, it's a big open question. I, I don't know where the water is going to come from. I don't know where the food is going to come from. So what I, what I fear is that there will be, that, that many billions of those people are going to be unable to continue living where they live now. And, you know, in agricultural areas of South America, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and they're all going to want to move somewhere where they hope they can survive. And that is going to produce conflict wherever, wherever they move. Uh, so there's that element of, of the picture. How are people going to be fed and housed and provided with water in this future uh, so far, we don't we don't know the answer of that. We can look to Cape Town, South Africa, one of the wealthiest cities in Africa, running out of water as we speak, and it's partly reflects what I'm talking about because people are banned in the countryside in Africa and moved to the cities on the coast. These cities are running out of water, and they're all going to be inundated by by rising seas. Uh, I'm going off now. <laughs> no, no. This is uh, th this is what I was what I was hoping you're going to do. Yeah. So, uh, so you asked. Uh, I I don't think that we will adapt in time to 
save everybody and save everything. There will be cities will have to be abandoned, countries will have to be abandoned, and whether we can, this is what I fear, uh, whether we can accommodate all of the climate refugees on the planet and their billions, how we're going to do that, I just simply cannot foresee. Uh, so to to avert that. Uh, we really have to stop emitting greenhouse gases tomorrow, not only from fossil fuels, but from beef production and deforestation and other sources of greenhouse gases. But you don't, you don't seriously uh, see that happening tomorrow, do you? Or do you? I don't seriously see that happening tomorrow. So that tells us <laughs> that um, I fear that we're not going to reach the goal of the climate, uh, the the Paris Climate Agreement, which is to keep warming uh, increase of two degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial level. It's now already one degree, and there's probably another one degree Celsius. That which would be uh, 1.7 degrees Fahrenheit, um, where all, uh, the two degrees I I think is already built in. Um, I think we're going to go to four degrees Celsius increase by when the minimum. Um, you know, before the middle of the century. You think four C before the middle of the, the, the century? So so. Without spending too much time on it, I always like to ask people who know more about the subject than I do. What is, what is your opinion of the the Paris Climate Agreement? It, it, it's, this seems to be the what what I understand is the single best idea that we have come up with as a species to turn this uh, freight train around. Is the Paris Climate Agreement going to do? what it claims it's going to do. I, I, if you just take it as a, if you look to it as a, as the solution, that if we do everything in that agreement and think that's going to solve us, the answer is no. It's not. If you take it as a, as a living document that has the capacity to evolve and to um, to to keep to keep changing and, and improving in in, in, in in as time goes on as people become more aware of the risk and realize they have to step up the game yes it, it provides the best vehicle the best platform for addressing the problem but it, 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 if not if the current text is the only thing we have, even if we did accomplish everything, implement everything in the existing text, it's not going to save us. We have to do more. But there isn't any other platform out there to substitute for that. So we have to, we have to do our best to implement that. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm as I said, there's there's so many subjects that 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 I want to that I want to touch on with you since in the in the limited amount of time, if we can, it, 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 as easily as I could fill up the rest of the hour uh, talking about climate change. So many of my interviews are are, are with you know climatologists and whatnot. If if I can. If we can just steer away from the from the whole climate change thing now and just assume that this is you know go to Disneyland and pretend like climate change had nothing to do with what's going on just it, it magically erase climate change as a threat to uh, this planet uh, it seems to me that there's plenty of other things uh, at, at work uh, other than climate change and and going on uh, on this planet right now that nobody is talking, at least a few people are talking about climate change. Yeah. But if you had to, to choose 
uh, a, a couple of other subjects that you don't think that that you are not hearing any discussion and debate about, whether in the political realm or just the media or the public realm. What would a, a couple of your top issues be that no one's talking about? Ah, uh, yes. Well, we that, that, that's that's good to be given that opportunity. I mean, the one that I'm focused on now increasingly is the nuclear arms race that's getting underway. And we had a number of very, um, you know, frightening developments just in the past few weeks, including the release of the nuclear posture review by the Trump administration and the very scary speech by Vladimir Putin on February 28th. So I could speak about that and its wow. consequences. There's also the decision by the Chinese Communist Party to eliminate term limits for their yeah. president. So we could talk about that. I think all these things are interconnected. Talk about talk uh, well, well. Talk about the the famous Putin speech in the in the uh, nuclear warheads raining down on on Florida. Well, what is your what what was that all about? What what that's all about? It, this is one of those histories of, uh, you know, which comes first, the chicken or the egg sort of thing. This goes back to the end of the Cold War. At the end of the Cold War, uh, there was this kind of giddy moment when we thought that, that uh, n nuclear weapons arms racing was over, that the Cold War superpower rivalry between the U.S. and the Soviet Union was over, that the U.S. and Russia could be buddies, or at least could, could uh, cooperate on major issues. Uh, there was even talk of someday bringing Russia into NATO. Uh, there, was, there, was, there was a honeymoon period after the end of the Cold War when we thought that the, the dark side of things had been eliminated. You know, and then it didn't turn out that way. No, and, it didn't. Yeah, you know, relations between the U.S. and Russia began to sour. And here's where the chicken and egg thing comes in. Who, 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 who's responsible for this? And if you go to Washington and talk to people, everybody will point their finger at Vladimir Putin. But if you go to Moscow, <laughs> uh, they'll... They, they, their analysts will point to Washington and to, and to Berlin and to Paris and London and say, well, look, you folks, you folks promised us at, at the end of the Cold War when we, when we uh, allowed the two Germanys to reunite and we, we took our forces out away from Eastern Europe and so on that NATO would never be expanded to our borders. You promised us that, and you betrayed us by bringing the Baltic republics yeah. and other former members of the Warsaw Pact into NATO, but the Baltic republics were at one time part of the Soviet Union. So this is like Russia stationing troops on Hawaii or Puerto Rico or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they they see this as the original sin, uh, and, and they also see the U.S. fortifying those places with new weapons. Uh, I I I don't want to I don't want to be the one who who says who's the bad guy. Both sides, I think, engaged in behavior that contributed to the souring of relations. Putin uh, also did things I find despicable, uh, the occupation of Crimea, the intervention in Ukraine. So who came first? I don't know. But both sides contributed to this. Now, the specific issue that you asked about, Hambone, is the weapons that he talked about. And here's the thing. Uh, Supposedly, uh, the U.S. had a position that nuclear weapons were only intended for use in a second strike, a retaliatory yeah, yeah, yeah. strike, 
if we were attacked. But that's not always been in the minds of U.S. strategists. They've always had some notion that there might be a time when we want to engage in a first strike, or at least it seems that way to the Russians. And, you know, you have to be a nuclear physicist with top secret clearance to really get at the bottom of this, and I certainly don't have that. But what the U.S. has done is deployed nuclear, um, I'm sorry, is deployed anti-ballistic missile interceptors in Eastern Europe, in what was the, the former Warsaw Pact countries in Romania and Poland, that we claim are solely intended to shoot down Iranian missiles that might attack Europe or NATO. And the U.S. claims that these have capabilities that make them uh, useless for attacking Russian ballistic missiles. But the Russians see this as a potential threat to their ability to, to retaliate against a U.S. strike. So what Putin is saying, we can't take the chance yeah. that the U.S. might someday have a capacity to shoot, to launch a first strike on our side and intercept our retaliatory missiles. We have to have foolproof retaliatory capacity that will work no matter what the U.S. does. So we're and right back. We're right back to, to to duck and cover. We're right back to duck and cover. Uh, That's right. So, and so the, what what do you think? And I mean, we're, you know the big boys. As long as we're talking about uh, the U.S. and Russia. What in your mind it would be the most likely thing? Would, would it be would it be an accident, uh, kind of like that false alarm thing that happened in Hawaii uh, uh, a few weeks ago? Is is it if something really horrific goes down? It's, it seems to me like it, the, the chance of it being an accidental, just right on down to human error or AI error or something, uh, spark in this thing. Uh, I, I worry about something else. I worry about the almost daily near collisions between U.S. and Russian airplanes yeah. along this, what they call the Eastern Front. Which, which, which we call it the Eastern Front, they call it the Western Front, yeah. you know, which stretches from, <clears throat> from Finland down through the Baltics, through Poland to the Black Sea. And every day almost, there are U.S. planes and NATO planes up there, and sometimes the ships in the Baltics yeah. and the Black Sea mixed in where... Our side is engaging in maneuvers and exercises, and the Russians are engaging in maneuvers, and they come in a near collision path with one another. You can go online and, and you know, Google uh, near intercepts over the Black Sea, and you could actually see pictures of Russian planes coming almost within touching distance yeah. of American planes. Yeah, that's all and it's going to take. Yeah, and you know, sooner or later, this is there's going to be a crash, or or an incident, and we're going to shoot down a Russian plane, or they're going to shoot down one of our planes, and somebody is going to, you know, some captain of a ship or whatever is is going to jump the gun and fire off missiles, and before anyone can get control of this, the whole thing is going to heat up because they're yeah. already on hair trigger alert yeah, in all yeah. of these places. So that's what I worry about. In a way, the Iron Curtain was, was that we used to talk about in the old days. It wasn't actually an Iron Curtain, but it was a very fixed border and, and, and there was no hanky-panky going along, uh, on uh, uh, or, or everybody knew enough not to, not to mess around. Right now, we have a much more fluid situation in these areas, and I, you know the Russians engage in all kinds of nasty stuff, 
uh, but so do we. And that's what I worry about. <laughs> okay, let's move from the the, the big boys. Yeah, another thing with someone uh, of my of my limited analytical uh, abilities here, another sea change between when you and I were kids and, and, the, and this new crop of future bullet bags uh, coming up is there's a lot more players in the game and, and, and there's a lot more small potatoes and, and hotheads and more and more. We got the guy over in North Korea, we got this stuff heating up along India and Pakistan and, uh, and, and of course China looming over the whole thing. Um, j j just just address the just the pure proliferation uh, of the number of new players in, in this new world uh, that that we that we've never seen as a planet. There's just so many more places, more personalities and hotheads that 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 could set off this spark. You know, somewhere where we're not even paying attention to, and it's going to come out of left field. Well, you're absolutely right about that, and that's, that's why I worry about these flashpoints like the Baltics and the Black Sea, where, where Turkey is yeah, Turkey. becoming a player. Yeah. Uh, my, and on the other side, my big worry is the East China Sea and the South China Sea. And about to talk about India and Pakistan. Uh, Saudi Arabia is also beginning to throw its weight around and, and is in a deal, is negotiating a deal with the United States to buy nuclear reactors, supposedly yeah. for power, but you know that they also want enrichment technology, which would allow them to make a nuclear bomb. So you're absolutely right about that. There are more players. There are more players that possess nuclear weapons than ever. And they they have their own ambitions that complicate things. They're they're not under the thumb of the superpowers. They have their own agenda. Turkey, Saudi Arabia, India, Pakistan, North Korea, and others. Israel. Um, so they could get into a fight and bring the rest of us into it. And then things well, all hell breaks loose. Talk a minute, uh, for some, I don't know why, this is just a hunch of mine uh, that, that I don't think anybody is talking about. I, I don't think there, I've ever gotten a comment one time, as many times as I have said this. Uh, I, I don't make many predictions, I really don't. I, I, I joke around calling myself a doomsday prophet, but I really don't make many predictions. But for some reason, Michael, I don't know why it seems to me that the South China Sea, if, if I have to look into my crystal ball, the South China Sea just keeps appearing in my tea leaves, it is where if I have to call where World War III is going to erupt, it's going to be in the South China Sea. And I don't know why I feel so strongly about this. Correct me if I'm wrong or confirm if I'm right. Uh, where do you put the South China Sea and its twin sister, the East China Sea, in, into this whole, and certainly drawing uh, connecting dots between nuclear uh, war on this planet and resource wars? And nowhere uh, other than possibly the Arctic is this unfolding in the South China Sea. Can you? rip for a while on your opinions of the South China Sea? Well, I'm happy to do that. Now, now I have to say, uh, uh, maybe a little bit uh, breaking here, I have, I have a chapter on the South China Sea in my book, Resource Wars, which was published in 2001. So South China Sea has been on my radar at least that far back. And it's for, it, it's for some of the reasons that you indicated it, it, it South China Sea has multiple danger points it is first of all the major uh, the, the major shipping lane in Asia something like 40 percent of world trade goes through there every day maybe even more it's how all those goodies that China produces 
and Japan and South Korea and Taiwan produce, all that stuff that's sold in Europe goes through the South China Sea, and all the resources they need to produce all that stuff comes to them by sea, including all of their oil. Japan gets yeah. like 95% of its oil comes through the South China Sea. So it's a vital, it's a vital artery for resources and goods. So anybody who controls those shipping lanes, I, I mean, you, you block, you, you block those shipping lanes, and, and, and it looks to me like in a matter of a week or two, the global industrial economy is on its knees. But, but, but there, you know, there are uh, there are other routes, but they're very expensive. Yeah. You have to go way, way out, around, far out into the Pacific. So it'll. It won't cripple the world economy, but it, you know, it could yeah. produce a global recession, and it would cause huge problems. But there's more, because uh, U.S. strategy, our our Western forces are are forward deployed in Japan and Okinawa and Guam, and those are the forces that support the war in. Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria, they they go through the South China Sea yeah. uh, from Japan on their way and, and going back. So from a strategic point of view, we consider that pathway absolutely essential to U.S. strategy. And we've made it very clear that anybody who sought to interfere with our freedom of navigation, as it's called, to move our warships, through that area would be an act of war. So this is where it starts getting, you know, scary because when when you, it's not just trade, we're talking about a uh, causa belli, to, to use the technical word, and we consider that a legitimate act of war. Meanwhile, China has built up military bases on these uninhabited islands by, by digging up sand from the bottom of the ocean and wow. putting it, you know, piling it up and then building airstrips and weapons on them and claiming that this area belongs to them. So there you have, right there, a scenario, a conceivable scenario that could spark a conflict. Well, also at the that. at the bottom of the South China and the East China Sea, I that clearly has to be part of the mix, particularly China's bullying the the smaller players, all those other people uh, who are claiming uh, it's the talk about what you believe is at the bottom of the. Uh, of the South China and the East China Sea, and how and and how this is uh, fixing in the playing into the mix. Yeah, well, of course, I always look for whether there's a resource dimension to this, and indeed there is. Uh, there's thought to be a considerable amount of oil and natural gas in both in both yeah. seas, the East China Sea and the South China Sea especially in the South China Sea, and China wants to have it all, and they've claimed the entire region is theirs to exploit. And they started drilling, but they are drilling in areas claimed by South Vietnam and the Philippines, not South, Vietnam and the Philippines. Yeah. And uh, that has led to near clashes because the Chinese send out their naval ships to protect the drilling rigs in Vietnam, and the Philippines have sent out their Navy ships or Coast Guard ships to try to drive off the drilling rigs. So there you could have another spark for conflict. In the case of the Philippines, we have a mutual defense treaty. If the Philippines is attacked, we have a treaty obligation to come to its defense. So that's another pathway to a U.S.-China conflict. Same holds with Japan. If Japan comes under attack in the East China Sea, we have a treaty obligation to come to its assistance. This, this is how world wars get, get, uh, get, get started, or all of these treaty obligations that 
that, that, that people aren't talking about. What do you think about the, this thing that came out of the left field on Thursday now with this trade war? Like, good Lord, what is this guy going to come up with next? Uh, do, you, do you think that this pressure cooker is going to be kept under wraps or is this latest stunt that uh that that trump is is it going to boil over into you know other areas not directly related to trade uh, well you, you put your you put your finger on it Hemo, and that's that's what you have to worry about exactly the trade issue itself is not get a cause of war uh, but it creates hostility and suspicion of, among parties. So go back to what we were just talking about, the spark of a conflict. Let's say there's a collision between a U.S. and a Chinese plane over the South China Sea or the East China Sea. If relations between the U.S. and China, between Washington and Beijing, are reasonably okay, you know, where the two presidents could get on the phone and say, look, we're really sorry, that was an accident, <laughs> it was an overheated young guy in the plane, yeah. made a mistake, we're sorry. But if, you know, if you have a trade war underway and nobody's talking to each other and the mood is lousy um, and we're suspicious of everything the other side is doing, then you don't have that kind of conversation and in a crisis one bad thing leads to another now this is exactly exactly the atmosphere that led to world war one mm -hmm. and i urge your listeners to read the book sleepwalkers about how the leaders of europe walked slept sleepwalked into world war one they didn't think this was going to happen but they led a little crisis in Sarajevo. Um, they each pushed their weight around. Not, not, you know, they distrusted everybody else. They thought the other guy would back down. They didn't think things through. And one thing led to another. And, you know, before long, 50 million people are dead. Yes, sir. That is, uh, wow. Uh, I, I, uh... Where are we already? Good, good Lord, we're already 48 minutes I I into this. Uh, as I say, I, I, Michael, I, I, I could sit down here and, uh, and, and, and talk, to, talk to you for hours, uh, but I need to, well, we got 12 minutes left, okay, at, at the most. Uh, so d d d give me your, your wrap-up opinion on just boiling all of this down. Uh, I want the, the first part of this question is, as a species, just purely a, as a species, with the doomsday clock sitting at 11.58 p.m. and ticking, and all of this stuff going on on, on every level, and, and we have barely scratched the surface, barely scratched the surface. Uh, how are we responding to this? Are we rising to this, or is Homo sapien sapien rising to this challenge to, to avert the, the obvious catastrophe building on this planet or not? That's a good question, and uh, you know, I, I, the, the short answer would be not really, but on the other hand, uh, I probably, we're not seeing, I'm not seeing things happening that could be uh, game changers. I, I, I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. The shooting in Parkland, Florida a couple of weeks ago, um, I, I thought that after 17 people were killed, there would be a week's worth of outrage, and then nothing would happen about gun control. But that's not been the case, because the teenagers in that high school have risen up and, and turned the conversation around. So there, there, there is a very real possibility that uh, younger people around the world are who, who are much more aware of what we're talking about, I think, than people our age or 
I'm an older person, um, may take this, may, may see all this that we're talking about and say, no more, enough is enough. We're going to take things into our own hands and uh, put the world back on a peaceful, uh, sustainable path. So you and, have so you have faith in the uh, in, in the generation that we've left this mess to clean up. Uh, are are they going to be able to clean up the mess we're we're leaving them, or, or are they just going to keep making a, a a bigger mess of the mess we're leaving them? I, I I think they're much more sensitive to what's going on than current you know people now in power. So I do have some optimism about that. Uh, but my, my basic sense is that um, there are places on the planet where people are making great strides in the direction of a sustainable human future, and many places that are not. And eventually, uh, the pressures are going to be so great that that only the places that are making strides are going to stri uh, survive in any kind of decent, humane sort of way. And the others are going to collapse with ugly consequences. So some humans, some human communities will survive and prosper, and others will not. They'll be, that, that's, and the ones that adapt to green technology and alternative ways of living, those are the ones that are going to survive and prosper. And you can look around the world and see where those places are. You know, cities like Vancouver and Toronto and Canada and Copenhagen, you know, and I could point to others. Okay. Uh, I... I, I... Uh, I, I, I I wish I shared your uh, optimism, Michael, but I'm not gonna I'm not I'm, I'm not gonna debate as. Uh, but okay, we got eight minutes, man. So I want to move I want to move it from the as I as I as I wrap up all of these. So if you're someone listening to this, so uh, you're you're on YouTube uh, and you've stuck with us for 52 minutes listening. Uh, listening to this conversation, hopefully getting something out of it, you're probably going to be asking the question, exactly what am I supposed to do with this information? And what is your advice just to the individual person coming into this knowledge? Uh, what, what is your advice to them both in the, you know, just how to uh, how to deal with this knowledge, how to respond to it, and, and how not just to let it completely overwhelm and, and depress you. Uh, yes, of course. So, you know, I, 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 I think that's a reasonable question, and, and every, everybody has to think about it and, and, and do whatever is within their capacity. So my answer to that is always the same. It's, uh, you know, you first look at what you could do in your own household to both uh, reduce your contribution to all these problems and protect yourself from them. Can you make your house more energy efficient? Can you reduce, uh, you know, your transportation? Uh, can you convert your transportation to make it less uh, fossil fuel dependent? All those things. And then start there, the household. Then look at your neighborhood and your community. What could you do in your community to make it more resilient, less of a, you know, less impact on the planet and more resilient in the face of the changes that are gonna come? And there's a lot that communities can do to do that. They have to think about future water supply how to address drought, uh, how, and that leads to all kinds of decisions when you think in those terms. Uh, and how to um, ensure energy that is uh, independent of the grid if necessary and is only relying on the sun or on the wind. You know, and then you have to think nationally and internationally. How could we, how could we convince our leaders to adopt more sane 
policy. So it's, it's cover it's cover your own ass uh, the best you can and slowly uh, work out from work out from uh, your 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 own little uh, piece of ground and that that's really about all, all you can do, right? Yes. Well, I think there's a lot you could do in the neighborhood and in the community. I think people are beginning to understand that that. Um, communities, neighborhoods have to become more resilient in the face of climate change. That, 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 uh, all our neighborhoods are going to come under assault one way or the other, whether it's from, from, uh, from coastal erosion and, and sea level rise or from drought or from firestorms and there's a lot you could do if you if you get together members of the community and say what what is it that we what can we do together? I'm sitting in a community. Uh, we're in a floodplain in the state of Texas, Garfield, Garfield, Texas. I we're directly we we dodged the Harvey bullet last year by about sixty miles. Uh, is is from from the Harvey bullet and uh, so it's either put sandbags eight feet tall or, or I'm selling my place uh, but I got it for tax reasons I have to wait and I, I'm heading probably to upstate New York is what I'm doing uh, you know bu buying a piece of land not in a floodplain uh, w w with a well and, and uh, a, a place to plant a big garden and but you know, I understand there's only so much that, that any one of us can do, but we gotta we gotta go ahead and do it. We gotta get up tomorrow and plow through it. And, and sure, and 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 some of this can be can be fun and and rewarding. So I'm at a college campus, Hampshire College, that has addressed this as a co college wide basis. So our college has a farm. Yeah. And, you know, I'll be perfectly honest. When I first came there, I thought that was a joke. What do we need a farm for? That's before I was enlightened. I'll be <laughs> honest, I, I, I was unenlightened. Now our farm is one of the most, you know, one of the most, our most valuable assets. We grow organic food on the farm. Students do classes where they learn about sustainable agriculture. It's a big hit. And the farm supplies food to the student cafeteria. Oh. So that's an example of what I'm talking about. And, and people work in the farm love it. Oh, City. well, I, I, I hope I, I'm heading that way in a couple of months. But we are at 58 minutes. So in uh, two minutes, this camera is going to shut off. So, Michael Clare, you have 60 seconds. You, you, CNN has a microphone in front of your mouth instead of him and a little tail. You have 60 second sound bite, uh, 60 second sound bite to leave these list, leave your listeners with your message to the world. <laughs> That's hard for me to do, college professor as I am. You know, I, as I, I see it, we're, we're, we're in a world where, where choices have to be made and where the choices will matter. Either you embrace the reality of climate change and the other things that I talked about and, and see that, that, that dramatic changes have to be made or you resist those necessary changes. And in the end, those who, who embrace the changes that are necessary and, and create a more sustainable culture and community are going to survive and thrive in, the, in a troubled future. And those who don't are going to suffer. And I, I would like our country and our, my community, our country, to be among the survivors. Uh, but it will require that we change our policies to make that possible. Okay, well... With that, as much as it breaks my heart, we're going to have to break off. Now, stick around for a minute after I sign off. But, guys, uh, I really want to thank Michael T. Clare for taking an hour out of his busy schedule to come visit with us. And uh, hope we can do this again in the near future, Michael Clare. It's been a great pleasure talking with you. All right. Bye, guys.